So uh, hello and welcome to Music in the Mind. This is one of the first events of Annam 2019 here in DCU. My name is Carl McDonnell and I'm with my lovely friend, Mr. Gavin Kelly. How are you doing, folks? Um, we are Bit from up. a very little known podcast called In Conversation With. And we were delighted when we were approached to, um, to host this um, panel. We've done some amazing interviews so far. This is our first ever live podcast, which is fantastic for us. Um, and we're, we're very happy to be here. So thanks to Shiva, of course, at the back of the room there, who, um, who let us uh, take part in this. Um, and we're, yes. Um, yeah, so we're gonna get straight on our way. So basically this panel is going to be looking at musical artists and mental health. So how the two intertwine and how is musical artist um, mental health um, is a part of being a songwriter and an artist. So we're joined here today, I'm very thankful to be joined here by God Knows, an Irish grime artist, and Paddy Hanna, a Irish singer-songwriter. So guys, if you could each just uh, tell the crowd, um, if they're not exactly familiar, just a little bit about yourselves. Paddy, do you want to get us on with you? Uh, yeah, howdy doody there, folks. Uh, my name's Paddy uh, Hanna. Uh, in the year 2007, I thought, hey ho, let's get into the whole music thing. Uh, took a while. I was in a band called Grand Pocket Orchestra. We were very wacky. I wore a lot of tie-dye and very baggy Tribe Called Quest t-shirts. Eventually I realized the whole wacky thing wasn't for me and I became an elegant scarf-wearing uh, singer-songwriter guy. And um, uh, in the year 2014 I released a solo album called uh, Leafy Stiletto. Why did I have to think of that? Uh, it did okay, got good reviews, got, got snubbed for a choice nomination because U2 released that stupid album on iPods and for some reason they felt that should be nominated. What, it, what can you do? Uh, then uh, I uh, put out a couple of singles, one of which was called Camaraderie that um, detailed my issues, uh, my dealings with uh, mental health and so forth. I then released an album in 2018 called Frankly I Mutate, which if, I, if you don't mind my saying folks, the critics went wild for. So uh, yeah, hate to brag. Uh, sorry, by the way, I've got a very nervous energy going because I've been drinking coffee all day. So old Jitterbugs Hannah is just rattling on, isn't he? So, yeah, there you go. Just a, that's, a, that's a quick uh, heads up for you. All right. How do you follow that? <laughs> uh, my name is God Knows. I am an MC. Um, also... Uh, Blessed to be part of a group called Rusangana Family with my brothers Merli and my name is John. And yeah, we've been going since 2012. And in, yeah, that don't really like this part of the thing because you have to kind of say everything. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I've been fortunate enough to do some really cool things, um, including uh, winning the Choice Music Prize in 2016, which is cool. Uh, Good for you. <laughs> Fantastic. So my first question, guys, when you were approached to do this panel, obviously mental health is a topic that's becoming more talked about day by day, but it is still quite a sensitive subject. Um, what endeared you to take part in this panel today? Well, Dara asked me, and uh, I like Dara, he's nice, where is he? Look at him there, with his lovely beard. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, give me a microphone and I'll go, you know? That's the first thing. But I mean, I, y when you're involved in music, you're going to face mental health related issues, you know? And I, just by virtue of that, have walked in those shoes. I have suffered depression that went undiagnosed for many years, and that was going on while I was participating in music, which is basically a mental health landmine if you're not careful and if you overindulge. Um, so just by virtue of being in music, I, I'm not an expert in this by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm happy to tell some stories, maybe give some info, we'll see. I might just rattle on, we'll, we'll find out. But I don't know, I think I've reached the point where I can start talking in an open forum like this. And you know, it's scary, folks. It's easier to sing. True. Uh, so, for me, I feel like, yeah, it's, it's something that's very, very important 
because people need to hear about it from us as well because I think it's something that affects us musicians a whole lot and if we're not talking about it I think it just makes it kind of something that you end up medicating instead of kind of helping uh, yourself or getting help and I think since we're in a vocation or a job that requires us to be okay you know because you want to look at everyone's looking at you and when everyone's looking at you you're inclined to want to say that you're okay all the time and I think we're just making it cool to actually say I'm actually not okay today uh, because you know actually that's really what ends up happening a lot and which is why you end up finding a quiet corner to you know to kind of yeah to whatever your vice is you know it can be something simple or it can be something quite dangerous but I feel like if we are talking and we're being healthy let's make it cool to be healthy you know if we're making it cool to be healthy by drinking water let's make it cool to be healthy in the mind as well so that's why I think it's quite important for me to be here saying this um yeah really fantastic yeah so I just want to ask how long or when did you first realize that mental health could affect you in your work but just in life in general when did you first become aware of mental health let's say well um I had got, I would say, I, I embraced my issues in around 2015. And I'm really catching up with that. There are a lot of things, and this is why I'm kind of scared, because there are things that I'd love to just scream out right about now, but it's not quite the time. Um, as I say, 2007, you know, I form a band. I'm a massively insecure dude. I'm dressed like an idiot. You know, I got big old floppy hair and this and this and that. And I am tremendously insecure about what I'm doing. I live in perpetual fear that everyone hates me and that being on a stage, you know, you're just waiting for that rotten tomato to hit you in the face. Uh, all the while you're trying to write, you're trying to be creative, you're trying to be loved. You know, this is like, music is such a, it's a hard thing to get into because like most of the times when you first get into it, the motivation is to be loved, okay? You want to be on a stage and you want the adulation of an audience. That's very hard to earn. After a while, you realize, this is why, like, you know, people form bands, they get the jackets and this and this and that. And, they, and then they're like, you know, oh yeah, this is so much cool and this. And then eventually they, they kind of stop because it's like, oh, it's a lot of effort. For me, I eventually realized that I actually give a toss about music. I, the, the writing part overtook the need to be loved. And for that reason, I kind of, uh, I, I've stuck with it for all these years, you know, but it is, a, it is an emotional minefield. And um, I mean, I, I've spent, I, I've got journals from when I first started off in bands and they are just, they're like Jack Torrance's uh, di <laughs> diaries, you know what I mean? For all you Shining fans out there. Uh, like they are, there is no joy in them. And meanwhile, I'm on a stage being like, you know, with like toy keyboards going, I'm a wacky guy. And like, you know, just at the time I was a completely broken or soon to be broken individual. And um, I just thought that was normal. I thought that's who I was. I thought there was no hope. I thought living a, the life of a hopeless individual was just my lot in life. And imagine that, imagine being in your 20s and just assuming that's how you're supposed to be without ever stopping to ask the question, why do I feel this way? And um, there was an incident that occurred in 2015 where uh, I, you know, trip to the beach, stones, pockets kind of job. And I decided that there and then after a very serious conversation with loved ones that uh, certain changes need to be made. And um, there, that's when I, around the time I wrote a song, the camaraderie track and completely changed tack. I started going to uh, parties and things, and I just say, listen, lads, just so you know, I'm kind of, there's a cloud over me at the moment, and I'm sorry if it inconveniences you. I may not be a great conversationalist at the moment, but it's nothing personal. I'm just going to let it pass, and when it passes, I'll be right back with you, champ, and these sorts of things. And that was amazing. I suddenly, I, was, I, I, I wasn't better, but I was on the road to being better. I, was, I had the confidence to say, wow, this is not something I need to internalize anymore. I can just, I can talk to people and tell them, uh, you know, I, uh, I, there's just a cloud and it's fine. And then what happened was, 
other people started saying the exact same thing to me. Oh, yeah, Patty, thank, thank you for bringing that up because, you know, I got a bit of a cloud over me too. And we're like, brilliant, we can just sort of sit here and be a little cloudy and then when it passes, we'll be grand, you know? And then I started opening up with people like, you know, people... Twitter is a funny place for cries for help. You know, every once in a while, someone's going to put up a tweet and it's going to be like, you know, I'm feeling a bit middly boop. And then, you know, I'd send them a little DM and say, here, how's it going? I hope you're doing good and this and this and that. And they'd message back. And then suddenly I'd meet them and they'd be like, oh, thanks for messaging. And I'm like, oh, thanks for messaging me back. And it was like, I became compassionate. I, beca like, I stopped being this cynical little music prick. Uh, who hid behind his instrument and thought he was Captain Cool. And suddenly, I was hugging people and I was shaking hands and I was like, ah, oh, God, you know, good for you. I felt good for, uh, for people instead of just being this internalized, hate-filled individual. And I realize I'm hogging the mic here, by the way. Um, so I'll pass it on a, in a second. But that, for me, was kind of my moment where I opened up, stopped being, and I'm glad you brought up the idea of, you know, being loving is, is a cool thing, you know? Being healthy is a cool thing, although I will say drinking beer is deadly. Um, uh, we'll talk about beer later, folks. But yeah, that's, that, that's sort of my hot take for the moment. And sure, we'll, we'll crack on in a minute. So I'll stop hugging the mic. Can you repeat the... the <laughs> yeah, no problem. Just, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, because there was a lot of great points, which is really dope, bro. Thank you. Um, yeah, you if you just, could, just so that I won't no problem. Um, uh, When did you it. first become aware of your mental health and how it can affect not only your work, but just yourself in general? You know, the funny thing about it is I think that I am coming into a deeper understanding because what it is is my knowledge of um, mental health was very shallow. But, it, you know, it, it, um, just like uh, Patty eloquently stated, um, life, life comes, you know, at some point you meet life and then that's when you become more aware. And I think personally for me, I'm still getting deeper in my grasp and understanding because it's okay to know but it, to understand that's where change can begin and for me personally it's something that has taken a very long time to really understand it because you can you can say different things that equate to what it is that you're feeling and you know all these things but I think I think it's something you have to really learn about. It's not something that I can just be like, I know everything, and I think I'm still learning. Um, my mental health, for me, is something that I've deeply come into understanding of it because in 2016, which is the highest of high, you win the Choice Music Prize, which is like, geez, if you're a musician, you've been working all your way up to this moment, you know, this moment where you're in the same room as people that you really respect and you love, you know. Um, but then that was, you know, after, you know, you know, what is it, mountaintop, you go into a valley, you know, it's just life, you know, ups and downs, right? So, yeah, went into the lowest low ever from 27, 2018. And I think only when you hit your rock bottom per se, that's when you really come into an understanding of uh, certain things. Just because um, I'm a born again Christian, so keeping tabs of how I am spiritually is something that I do. I mean, I go to Bible study every Monday, go to church every Sunday. So, I mean, everybody's got their own uh, way of uh, cleaning yourself spiritually, emotionally, mentally, you know. But I feel like I do it through faith. Now, just because you may be, you know, uh, I guess approaching, uh, what can I say? I, I'm trying to sp not speak Christianese here. Um, just because you have a way that you yourself engage in making sure that you're okay doesn't mean that it, mental, your mental health is okay. Because you could be doing all the great things like, you know, somebody plays sports and they wake up at 6 a.m. every day and they go jogging and they do, uh, they eat well, but your mental health is a completely different thing. Um, just because it's very complex, the mind is very complex, so the way you approach your mind is also needs the same attention in which spiritually you may go to uh, whoever, whatever your place of worship is. Um, 
you know, or physically you may be like, I'll get fit by running or whatever it is that you do, your mind actually deserves that. It deserves that. I don't even want to say, it, you know, you kind of need, no, no, it deserves, you deserve it. You are worth it. Uh, so I literally started radicalizing the way that I deal with the things that mess me up up here. Just because I don't drink. Like, you know, you just say, I don't drink, I don't do this. But then certain things start to affect you if your mind is not okay. Does that make sense? Like, even if you jog, you, you could end up jogging every day because you're trying to push yourself to the limit. Or you could end up doing other things to compensate for what your mind needs. And I, I decided to actually actively seek uh, my peace of mind. And once I started seeking my peace of mind, that's when the change began. But that only has been a recent thing because it took so long to figure out what, where, I was, where I was missing the mark. And where I was missing the mark is because I wasn't looking after myself like up here. You know, I wasn't taking the time to take stock of what, where are the places that I don't need to go in my mind in order for me to be at peace. So I think I've only, to answer, uh, I think you're gonna have a ball, guys, because I think both of us are very long-winded. But um, I, I, we're musicians, so what do you expect? We try to put our stuff in three minutes. We have a microphone, so y'all got it. Uh, but um, yeah, to make a long story short, I've only truly come into an understanding. And do you know what? I think that I'm cool with being on a journey for the rest of my life to really, really make sure that I'm making sure my mind is healthy. Fantastic. Well, you kind of mentioned it there, uh, how you're musicians, you're trying to fit things into three minutes. I just wanted to ask, as musicians and having these mental health struggles, how have you found is the best way to kind of express those emotions into songs? Are there ways you've, you've changed your writing style just to accommodate you know, what's going on inside and how to really express that musically through rhythm, melody, how it all comes together in a song? Um, well, I mean, we all have unique writing styles. Uh, everyone, basically. It's, you can read a book about, well, Bob Dylan did this or whomever did that. I mean, you have to find your own style. That's the most important thing. I think it's good to ex maybe read about how people write and this and this and that. But you need to find your own style. And I, what I do is uh, I will demo a track as roughly as possible, right? I'll get it done as quickly as possible. I won't worry about the lyrics. I won't worry about getting it tied or this and this and that. I'll just get it out there, and if it's catchy enough, I know there's something there. So I'll layer up some easy vocal melodies, uh, which I'll put loads of reverb on, because, you know, production. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, maybe just add a little bit of keyboard, harmonica, whatever, just to build up this kind of little nice melodic background. And then I have the base of a song. And then what I do is, basically, I live with that concept uh, for several months, and I don't touch it. I don't touch the lyrics, and I let the lyrics find the song. So usually when I complete the lyrics, it's in the week leading up to the actual recording of the record. Um, funnily enough, procrastinating was something I used to think was a terrible thing, and that would, be, that would have a knock-on effect on my mental health because I would be like, you lazy son of a gun. You just sit there, you throw out something real quickly, and then when you're, like the day before, you just throw the, uh, the lyrics down. But then I realized that's just how I do it. And like if you read up on procrastinating, you'll find that some of the most creative people in the world are procrastinators. And then I, found, I was reading up on it, and I found, wow, you know, I'm off the top of my head, Dan Harmon, the lad who does Rick and Morty and all that. It, it turns out he has the same kind of thing, you know? And uh, so I'm absolutely not insecure about that anymore. And uh, as far as, uh, you know, how I put my mental health into it, it's almost like a... It's almost like being on the old couch with the old therapist. No, well, not on the couch with the therapist, they're on a chair, you know, but... but <laughs> If you pay extra, maybe, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but um, basically that's what it is, you know, so I'll have the demos there, I'll, I'll usually put them up on SoundCloud, so I'll have like a SoundCloud playlist of like 30 odd demos, and I'll just listen to them daily, it's, it's quite arduous and could be very torturous, because they're like, oh god, I have to listen to these stinking demos again, but I'll just be walking around, I'll be down the beach, uh, I'll be uh, walking my dog or something, I'll be in the shop, and then suddenly, Something will connect with me on an emotional level, and I realize that's it. That's what the song needs. 
You know what I mean? And that's how I finish it. But, but it needs to start with, uh, this is catchy, this is the, the hook is good, and it's there, and I know I can work with this. And that is how I write, and uh, as I say, it, 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 I've only just thought of this, that's a good question. It is actually a form of therapy, and I never thought about that, you know? I, it's another thing about, you know, I said in an interview once, I was like, I said something really obnoxious, like, I write because I have to. I was like, all right there, Mr. Poet, relax, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a revelation I had recently, and it, it's, it, I'm completely comfortable with how I write now, but I tell you, there was a, the longest time I just felt like I was the laziest person in the world, and that was a reason to keep the head bowed in sorrow, I'll tell you that much. And uh, now I shall unhog the mic. <laughs> Do you want me to go on? I could go on. Um, don't feel like, yeah, sorry for the podcast. I was trying to make sure that he knows. Um, yeah. So when it comes to the way I write, I, as a, you know, um, as an MC, there's different gifts that different MCs have. Some MCs are really amazing at observation. So they can really make you feel like you're in the environment. Uh, so an example of an MC who does that would be Nas. Nas will make you feel like you are from Queensbridge, New York City, um, with the way he writes. Um, my brother Merle is like that, actually. He's a similar uh, MC type. I am an introspective MC, so similar to a Chance the Rapper or a Kanye West, where they can make you feel the way they feel in that particular moment, whatever they're feeling. Uh, so it's different, different people have different gifts. And for me, I guess it just adds to it because I will always come from a perspective of in my head. I am always rapping from my head. Um, and from there, everything flows out. I would say it's a similar um, description to what uh, Patty said as well, where you the, the blessing is in the rewrite. Because sometimes what you are feeling or what comes out straight away may not be the one, may not be the tune, may not be the end product because it's just what you're feeling. Uh, I actually started rapping because of that exact thing because I, when I moved to Ireland uh, when I was 11, I was the only black kid in my school and that led to a lot of questions of what's going on? Is that person being racist or are they just, are they just ignorant or what's going on? How come the teacher said that too? What's, what, what's going on in my environment? Blah, blah, blah. All these questions. And I put all that on paper and I started writing about it. This was before I got good at MC. And so it, I guess at first it was just a healthy habit of not going to fight somebody. Um, but then maybe that added to what my gift as an MC ended up being, which is introspective, being an introspective uh, person. Um, so the rewrite is because sometimes the first one, it may be good, but that ain't it. It's just what makes you feel good first. The rewrite is what, what uh, you know that everyone can relate to. For, for me, the blessing is if people can relate to what I'm writing down, I think that that's when I know I have a winner, especially with the, my style of MC, um, because it sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to do with how good I am sounding on a beat. It's also about how someone feels after they hear my verse. So yeah, I think I think it really does add well to a music. There's another thing that most musicians do. Um, I don't know if is there any other musicians in the room. Like who are doing their thing, sick. Uh, but don't worry, we're all musicians today. Uh, so you think you have to write when you're sad. I don't know. It's a thing. I don't know what it is about musicians. Sometimes you think, bro. Like I guess maybe even the strongest emotion is where you have to come from all the time. That's not true, and that's not healthy either. Um, you have to write when you're at peace, which is why the rewrite is very important which is why, like Paddy was saying, he rides around listening to the demos because sometimes that ain't it, because you need to know, is that really it? You know, is that really a good song? Because if you don't have a gauge onto what is a good song, then, you know, you need to make sure that you keep practicing to the point where you 
are confident when you can write like, yeah, I know this is a great song. And that takes a long time. And that's why the rewrite is very important because now you're writing objectively and you're saying, that's what's good. And I know that's what a great song is. So, yeah, it's... I think that's another fallacy about writing, isn't it? That you have to be in that state of mind, like you're of being depressed, to write about being depressed. And I find that's completely untrue. You write about your experiences with depression when you're not depressed, when you can write with clarity. Uh, because Absolutely. I, I cannot write when I am in, in a state of depression or fog because you have no motivation to write. You're just literally physically weighed down by this horrid cloud that just sits over you. And, you know, as writers, you write about your experiences, you know, the things around you, you how you interpret these things. And it's, it's, I find it personally impossible to write when I am in a depressed state. So, but yeah, I just thought I'd tag that one on there at the end. That's, um, now that you mentioned just your own experiences, how important is you as artists to draw on your own experiences in your song? Um, on the one hand, uh, I'm in two minds about it. Uh, I tend to write quite ab in, like the abstract. Sometimes I'll write about what's going on around me, but it's gonna be my take on what's going on around me. I'm not like, I don't think I'm ever gonna write a political song. Sorry, folks. Uh, you know, I, I like the absurd, I like the silly. Um, I've heard people talk, you know, about how you have, if you're not writing about what's going on around about the world at the moment, you're not paying attention. I was like, well, that's kind of a silly way of looking at it. Every writer is different. We all have our way interpreting the world. So um, I, would, uh, I would advocate that you do you. Uh, and as I say, um, what's that term? You know, there's, there's only, everyone else has taken that sort of thing, you know, just be yourself, you know. Um, yeah, that's so, the term, I think. Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, I forget who, to be honest with you, but uh, well done if you wrote that, if you're here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, I, 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 we all see the world differently. So approach it that way, and don't mind how Bob Dylan... I'm coming down very hard on poor Bob Dylan, but don't mind how... Don't worry how they... Nah, he, was a, he was a great songwriter, so I guess, he, you know what I mean? We need I was example. grand, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry if Bob Dylan is in the room today. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Bob. Um, all of them, Marley, all of them. Um, <laughs> They're all here, folks. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, absolutely. My, my way as a writer, I think that's the thing we, we're going to identify as well, is that every songwriter has a different gift of approach. So I'm sure if you set other people or other M or writers uh, in general, uh, here, they would approach it differently too. So um, don't feel like you have to, um, I guess, see it from our perspective, because there's loads, which is wonderful. Um, but the way I do it is m the people that impact me as writers are people that are able to, you know, uh, speak about what's happening in, in and around them. Now, um, for me personally, I'm t I'm a terrible liar. I cannot lie at all. So if you're my friend, you know that you can read it on my face. If I'm not feeling the situation, well, it's right there, and I can't run away from myself. Uh, so my writing takes the same form. Now, what I'm not going to do is air out people's laundry or things like that. I will always speak about me. Um, and my favorite, even my favorite comedians are comedians that will always speak from there, making fun of themselves first and then out. So that's the way I write. I always write from myself first and then and then out uh, and around me. So yeah, that's just the way I would kind of approach my MC style. But yeah, again, like I said, introspect, in, introspective, so. Uh, guys, I wanted to ask just, again, in the writing process, what enhances your creativity? Do you have books that you read or movies, other music? What inspires you? I can't wait to hear this. Oh. <laughs> what do you think I'm going to say? <laughs> Ooh. Um, uh, yeah, look, you know, inspiration can come from the weirdest places. I've gone on record. I, uh, the album I put out in 2018 was called, frankly, I Mutate, right? And uh, I realized just while I was making it that the, one of my most, like, 
influ the, one of the things that influences me, the coffee's kicking in here, folks. One of the things that influenced me most as a lad was, um, um, I suppose you, you buckle up, uh, was uh, the uh, Italian uh, zombie cabal movies from the early 1980s. Um, yes. Uh, I was I wasn't a huge music guy because I bought I was grown uh, bought up in a strange uh, musical household. It was all classical. It was either classical music or a woman's heart. That was it. My mum was a woman's heart. My dad was, you know, Mister Stickler for classical music. One of these kind of by the book people. He loved his Gilbert and Sullivan and these sort of wacky operas where people went hee hee -he a lot. Um, so that was kind of it. So. In some ways, I, I, I got a lot of my doo -doo 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 kind of melodies from growing up around Gilbert and Sullivan and um, what have you. So in my bedroom, or I'd watch like Channel 4 would have late night movies where I saw a movie called Zombie Flesh Eaters for the first time. And this was the first time I was exposed to these kind of Italio synth sounds and these synthesized kind of string noises where they would get like um, mellotrons and layer them up with maybe actual strings and then a voice going underneath. And uh, when I came to making Frankly, uh, I suddenly thought, uh, I want the string sounds to sound like um, the gentleman whose name is escaping me at the moment. Uh, sorry, dude, if you're, he's up there somewhere, I know that much. Uh, he, wrote a, he wrote the uh, string arrangements for a movie called Cannibal Holocaust. All right? now, Cannibal Holocaust is a legendary film. It said, basically, before the Blair Witch Project, there was the original found footage movie. And uh, he wrote the, ooh, no, it was Umberto Lenzi. No, he's a director. So I'm having a conversation with myself here. Uh, so basically, the, uh, the soundtrack for that, uh, it occurred to me that that was like the most influential soundtrack ever for me. And uh, so creativity comes from the most unusual of places. For me, I didn't realize until when I was making, frankly, that my formidable musical education came from classical music and Italian zombie cannibal movies. Uh, as for the lyrics, uh, gosh, only knows, you know, uh, I read a book every once and then, you know. But that was another thing, actually. Uh, when I was in school, I got slagged because I read novelized Batman books and stuff like that. And then my pretentious friend, Alan Murren, I'm sorry, I said his name. <laughs> we can beep it out, it's okay, post-production is a great my thing. My friend, Alan Beep, um, <laughs> He, uh, he was all like, well, why aren't you reading me by blah blah blah? I was like, because I like Batman. That's why I'm reading it. Because I like superheroes and stuff. And that does, I mean, well, I'm no less of a smarty pants just because I read something that you perceive to be stupid. I mean, if anything, that makes you the silly pants, you know? And every once in a while, I, I did philosophy in college. I did all that smarty pants stuff. But I liked reading books about Batman. And, um, and like, you know, uh, graphic novels and stuff like that. And sure, hey ho, daddy yo, now that's hip now. So who's got the last laugh, Alan Beep? <laughs> <laughs> that needed a moment of silence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, the way that um, I guess my creativity comes from my uncle was a famous musician in Zimbabwe, he went where I grew up. So. He was, he was big, man, in the 90, 80s and 90s, and even some of the 2000s as well. So I used to see my uncle on the TV when I was five. That was like, it was over from there. I was like, yeah, I can do it. So that's where I guess my confidence always stemmed from. I was, no, I can do it. Uh, so when I moved to Ireland, and then all my friends said, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. It was weird because... I saw my uncle on TV, man. Do you know what I mean? I'm sorry, like countless times. And, you know, we had like our own version of like the top 40 thing, like where they would play. That's why like when the genre Afrobeats, they didn't do the one from today. The genre Afrobeats, it's Afrobeats with an S because we would play all the music from Africa. And I've seen my uncle be number one on that. And I'll be like, oh my days, he's just beat some of my favorite musicians from Congo or whatever. So like, it, you know, to see that kind of changed everything. And of course, because I would be waiting for my uncle to be on the TV, I would also hear music from South Africa, including Lucky Dube or rumba music from Congo, Fela Kuti, all of these great African musicians. But then I would still see my uncle in the mix. So that 
that changed everything about who I would become because, you know, when we moved to Ireland, you know, I became a DJ in my family in, 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 in at home because we, we have parties all the time, literally. I don't want to DJ at par family parties anymore, but they still insist. But, like, I try to run away from it now. Um, but because I don't forget those songs. So once, if I hear a song I like, uh, which... Uh, makes me a bit weird uh, because I will go from listening to Bewitched to listening to the deepest like Tupac song that people never heard because I'm such a nerd I have the, I have Kanye West demos that people don't even know about and don't ask me uh, where I got them and stuff but I'm, I'm part of all those millions of forums of like just to hear that tune I have, you know, I'm, I, I collect music. So my creativity ranges. Honestly, uh, I do, I, I love that Bewitch song. Trust me, I still bang it out. <laughs> still bang it out. I, I still feel like they have one more album in them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe but, yeah, maybe I'm, a little collab with Bewitch in the future. Uh, do you know what? My street cred would die, but I'm cool with that. <laughs> I'm cool with that. Um, yeah, so I, I I keep up on I keep up on music. I'm I'm a I'm a music nerd. I want to know why Gary Barlow wrote that song. I like I love music. I'm not I'm boundary less in terms of what I believe is cool. I just love music. I can you know now that you said that I'm gonna go and check out all your influences. I might ask you later as well. Just I want to hear about your dad as well. Oh, well, we can talk about that afterwards. Oh, you, want to, you want to hear about my uncle? Oh, sorry, yeah, beg yeah. your pardon. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my dad is cool too, but um, <laughs> <laughs> he gets jealous that I'd say my uncle is my inspiration. Trust me, he does. Uh, so, dad, don't watch. I love you too, bro. Um, yeah, man. So that's that's where my my creativity stems from. My uncle did a lot. He tr he toured in France and and the world and stuff like that. So uh, I guess that changed my approach. So I. I always make sure that I don't stick to one genre. When I want to be inspired in hip hop, I go to listen to pop music. When I want to be inspired to write something different, I have to go to an extremely different place, uh, which is why in my car, uh, you will always be kind of like, how did he go from Spice Girls to Jay-Z? What's going on? But I appreciate music of all forms. Yeah, and it's important to dip your beak in absolutely every genre and go deep, you know? Don't, if, if, like, if you feel that you've, you're only listening to the same four or so albums at a certain period, you have to say to yourself, I need to hear more. I need to experiment. I need to tap into genres that I previously thought were a bit naff or whatever and go deep, you know? Uh, understand all aspects and facets of music and never... Don't, don't become complacent. You know, what's all that naff stuff about you? When you reach a certain age, that's your cutoff point. You stop listening to new music. That's absolute hooey. Always be experimenting. Always listen. Always expand your knowledge. Because even if you don't like a certain song, you might hear a drum beat or a synth sound and think, that, the tone of that. I want to apply that to my next record. So That's what I do. I, I, I literally, there's times where um, I, I work for Spin Southwest as well in... Yeah, on my side, I think you spin 1038 here. Uh, and sometimes I get there, literally, uh, everybody at spin is like, you live here, but I only have like a show on Saturday nights. So it's funny that I'm always there, but like sometimes I get there and I may listen to a song and I loop just four bars of that song. Same. I'm just listening to that loop. I'm like, do you know what I mean? Of whatever, it could be the most random thing ever. But uh, again, that's what keeps you creative. And I love to make sure that I'm listening to new music. Now, I don't like all new music per se. I don't have to love every little thing about it, but I'm like, I get, I get what they're doing. You know, I get why they did that. And until I do that, I'm not really inspired. And I think when I'm not challenging myself to go outside of my comfort zone, I, rem that's what it is. I remember when I was recording, right? I, as I was saying about the Italian strings, I, I, I said to Daniel Fox, the producer, I said to him, here, here, listen, I want the strings to sound like the soundtrack to a 1980s, uh, or no, early 1960s, actually, Italian uh, Mondo film. So go off, do your research, and make it happen, boyo. 
So this poor guy had to read up on all like the type of mics they use, the the this and this and that. But you know, he he uh, he earned his pudding that day. I'll tell you, you know. So like the mic position, where the people stand with the strings and all this. And these are the lengths that musicians go to. Well, not me. I just ordered them to do it. But I did the listening. I, I had a cup of tea or a beer or whatever and listened to music, and then I gave orders to people. You know. But that's the lengths you need to go to if you want to produce your own sound. You know, you can't just listen to a couple of records and think, oh, I'll, I'll just do those lads, get the same haircut, buy the same coat, sure it will be grand. You have to really find your sound and you have to go deep to find your sound. Um, we're wary that some of the audience might have some questions, so I'm gonna leave it on this and just to bring it back to the whole mental health. If you're having a particularly bad day one day, is there any little thing that you do to bring yourself out of that? Is there any anything you just maybe take some time to yourself, go see friends, anything that would take you out of uh, a bad swing? Um, I I have a good cry is what I do. Uh, it's good to cry. Uh, I'll watch some kind of a, like um, it's really it's quite I mean, it's quite embarrassing to say, but I'll watch some like YouTube video of like a a lion being you know, reunited with its like friend line or something. I go, <laughs> they're such good friends, you know? Uh, and like, you know, like I would literally go into the toilet and just be like, oh, they're such friends. And that, like, that's my way of just, just let it out, you know? But I don't know, it's fine, I mean, it's tears, come on. Relax Rambo, you can cry every once in a while, it's grand. So that's something I would do. Uh, sometimes I take it to an unhealthy level where I'll drink excessively and cry even more yeah, behind uh, closed doors. But um, that's one thing. Exercise is a good one. Uh, good old run is pretty good, yeah. Uh, also, this. This has actually been very cathartic for me. Like, if, I, if I'm just allowed to go and waffle uh, to anyone who's uh, willing to listen. Sorry, folks. Uh, that's, that's a good one. And I love cooking. I love just taking my time, the alchemy of food, watching onions turn brown, stuff like that. That makes me happy. Sick. Um, in a good way, I guess. Sick in a good way. I'd say sick, dope, sad. It's weird. Everything opposite is a good thing. Sorry. Just so anybody's listening, like, why did he say he's sick? Um, <laughs> but I think in, uh, mental well-being is very important. That's something I want to advocate for. I've, I, the biggest epidemic in the country that I was born, which is Zimbabwe, is uh, opioid addiction at the moment. Um, some of the people that I'm closest to, very, 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 very close to, are addicted to opiates, and uh, you know, which is uh, they do it in the form of cough syrup back home. Um, and I know that's because of their mental well-being has been compromised uh, a long time ago because of poverty. And now, you, we might just look at the poverty in Africa and just stop there, but there's poverty in ourselves. Poverty is lack. Uh, you can't heal what you don't reveal. Uh, it's something that Jay-Z said after uh, going to therapy, which I listened to a podcast, which is fantastic, by the way, if anybody ever want to see somebody who's going through a journey, and you could be like, they don't go through this, but it's Jay-Z, you know? Um, it's, it's on Rap Raider, so Jay-Z, Rap Raider, uh, yeah, podcast. It, it's two hours, it's really amazing, um, and he really is just uplifting. So I just kind of, if, you, if it's okay, uh, I think this is something that I would like to say uh, that's gonna take more than just a few uh, minutes just for me to make sure that I get it out of my head properly. So yeah, mental health, um, mental well-being is, is very important. The um, reason why I keep coming back to it is because I know for me, I'm just learning it now. Now, as a musician coming into uh, doing music in Ireland, I've always known where I want to go and I still know where I want to go. I want to go further than where I am, where I've reached today. And I came into music going, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to take drugs. I'm not going to... Because I knew that I know my, my habits, I know I'm a, I have an addictive personality, so I knew that was gonna be my pitfall. So that was, going, that was something I immediately, I reckoned in my head, and you know, the most we'll ever do, if you know Rusangana family, like, most we'll ever do is a beer to be like, well done lads, we did great, and then we drive home. Um, and it, yeah, those three things, it was like, don't drink, don't do drugs, and always go home. 
Uh, that's the reason why, even though we had money to stay somewhere, we always go home because the hour after a gig, trust me, you're emotionally shattered and mentally shattered. That you, you, it's, it's when you are tired. So I'm going to come back to being tired. It's when you are tired, that's when you're the most vulnerable to do anything, you know. As long as you're tired, someone could ask you something, you don't even know why you said yes, but it's because you are tired. Um, but that's where, uh, again, I, I'm going to uh, circle back because my mind uh, gets easily distracted. But um, with making sure that you are looking after uh, yourself mentally in health wise you have to be vigorous um the reason why because i i know I'm, I'm again like i told you i can't lie so that i know my emotions are easily compromised like i'm very easily compromised emotionally so that's something that i that's something that i recognize in myself so there's a few things that i needed to do uh for myself now i always been scared of being a role model because as I'm, it, it, I was always like, no, oh, man, like, man, I'm not good enough anyway. I'm not perfect. Um, why should I, why should I carry the mantle? This is so difficult. Like, you know, why do you want me to be something for, I'm, I'm, you know, but I've learned something. I've watched too many people start dying, especially people I care about because of uh, addiction to certain things because their mental health uh, have been compromised. Uh, so in this in, in 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 our era, syrup, uh, cough syrup is cool. Lean is cool. All these things are cool, but I've realized uh, the why is very important. Why? Because the for me after I realized my why, that's the moment I could honestly do something about it. So I've now started being vigorous, and and that was the moment I was okay to be a role model because. I, my role, being a role model is, doesn't mean I'm trying to be something I'm not. It's because I know my little brother, my little sister, and my cousins uh, also need something a little bit different to see because what they're seeing is that it's okay to self-medicate and hurt yourself uh, because you're not okay. But I think that being okay, you know, be honestly looking after yourself, it's just another way of taking, you know, you take a shower, you, you look after yourself, you, you know, lovely scarf and everything that we Thank need, you. you know what I mean? But what we need to also do is that make sure in your mind you also look as great, you know, you feel as great. And so that's something that now I look after myself. And I know the only, the only time that I drop the ball is when I'm tired. Because you are, you're fighting. You know, your defenses are low. You're always fighting, you know, fighting the... The urge to, because I'm, I'm an ex-smoker as well. I haven't smoked since 2011, but I'll tell you now, I'm still addicted to smoking. Because I have to say that. If I'm around someone and I'm feeling it, I'm like, oh, bro, like, you know, I need to go somewhere. Because I know how it affects me. And only when you're tired, only when I'm tired and that I'm around someone who's smoking, I'm like, no, man, you know, I might as well, you know. It's only today. So that's something that is very important, is to make sure that you are not going, exhausting yourself to a point where you can't work. Because as musicians, as a podcast that is in conversation with musicians today, as a musician, I'm telling you, make sure you don't overwork yourself to the point where you're exhausted because that's when your vices are gonna catch up to you. Because you may say, I quit smoking time ago, but I know if I'm tired, boy, that's it. Uh, I don't drink anymore, but when I'm tired, good luck. So I know that that's probably where people found themselves was because even as musicians, we just work to death because we just, we're, we're in a business of magic. And you know, shout out to managers, if there's any managers in the building, no? <laughs> Legendary uh, lady in the, inside as well, big up Eva, uh, mad respect. Uh, but as, as managers also, they also believe in that magic too. So God bless them without you lot. You know what I mean? Who also believe in us? Uh, we are in the same vocation of magic. So you, because we're always constantly looking for that magic, we we overwork. But now what I've learned is that I don't overwork myself anymore. I literally am only gonna work only when I'm my my tank is full. Because 
going on empty is when you compromise your mental health. Um, so I don't know, maybe this is for, not for anybody, but this is something that I recognize in myself as a musician because somewhat uh, we're attention seekers and when the attention is not on you, that's when you feel like you need something. I've started taking myself off social media because that's something that makes me tired. When I see someone post something silly, that makes me feel tired. When I see someone hurt themselves online, because sometimes I'm watching people literally go into their demise, that makes me feel exhausted. When I'm seeing someone doing better than me, that makes me feel, you know what I mean? So for my own mental well-being, I've started removing myself from anything that doesn't make me feel like I'm at my best. So I just want to work from a place of starting at my best. So that's something that helps me. So make sure that you are healthy in, in, in terms of just working at your best. And try to avoid empty at all costs. Um, I hope that helped a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm very, very long-winded. Um, no, I think that was a very good answer. Um, I think we've run out of a bit of time, but I'm sure if you have any questions to ask the two guys, they'll be more than happy to, to talk to you afterwards. Can I get a big round of applause for Paddy, Hannah, and God knows. Thank you very much, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure, lads, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Yeah, you know, the DCU represent, huh? Oh, <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> and a big thank you to my lovely co-host, Gavin Kelly, oh, well, as well. Great, lads. Thanks um, very much.